Our lecture today is going to be by Shona Jackson. Um, professor Jackson is Associate Professor of English and Associate Director of Grad Studies um, at Texas A&M University, where she teaches courses in Caribbean and Black Diaspora Studies and Postcolonial Theory. She received her PhD from the Interdisciplinary Program in Modern Court and Literature at Stanford in 2005. Her first book, Creole Indigeneity Between Myth and Nation in the Caribbean, was published in 2012, and it was the object of a standalone panel on its contributions to the field of Indigenous Studies at the Native American and Indigenous Studies Association annual meeting in May 2014. Her other publications include book chapters and journal articles in a number of uh, periodicals such as Theory and Event, Small Acts, Caribbean Quarterly, the Oxford Handbook of Indigenous American Literature, which won the 2017 MLA Prize for Studies in Native American Literatures, Cultures, and Languages, and Caribbean Literature and the Environment Between Nature and Culture. She was the founding co-editor of the book series in Caribbean Studies at the University Press of Mississippi and is a member of the Editorial Review Board of Decolonization, Indigeneity, Education and Society and an advisory and contributing editor for Kalalu, for which she co-edited the first 30th anniversary volume which was titled Reading Kalalu, Eating Kalalu and a special section on postcoloniality and blackness. She's currently at work on two books. The first one titled Marxism, History, and Indigenous, Indigenous Sovereignty in the Caribbean, and another titled Dialectics of the Flesh, Being and Teaching in the Academy. Please welcome Shona Jackson. <laughs> So good evening. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Koshi and the two graduate students in art history, Sarah Richter and Alyssa Braylauer, for organizing this. Um, it's <laughs> good to uh, be here <coughs> with you. Um, so my talk today is actually centered on work from my current book project. It is not about postcolonial theory per se. My title is thus, postcolonial theory, sort of, <laughs> not really, maybe not at all. <laughs> what I will outline is how postcolonial theory led me to my research focus and in that way gesture to its still unexhausted possibilities and enduring limitations. As a caveat, the way that I approach my project in the current book is not in fact routed through the field, um, something I did specifically for this talk. <coughs> I have found that although I have moved away from the post-colonial, because of the region I write about, the Caribbean, that is how my work is largely understood. Postcolonial studies still does the work in the academy of making certain spaces, geographies, times, and bodies intelligible. While at this moment I would be on trend in having some kind of scorn for the field, however, without it, in many ways, I would not have a job. I am indebted to its placeholding function, and in my specific case, its ability to absorb and reproduce the British Commonwealth within the academy. <coughs> It is or was at least 10 to 15 years ago, and in terms of hiring practices, the functional equivalent of the equal opportunity slot for the, glo the Global South. For Arif Derlich and Kwame Anthony Apaya, this, of course, this is of course our beginning, and the beginning of the pernicious displacement of our objects of study. Postcolonial studies is waning in the academy, displaced on some level by the world over the global, it has also been displaced by the add-on function of intersectionality and the politics of inclusion, as well as the primacy of other fields such as the digital, the environment, disability studies, Latinx, medievalism. This is in part because of the way in which the academy plays politics with all of our differences. For instance, I think that it's remarkable that we can have so many well-defined periods in English, 
but other areas emerge ad hoc and are often limited to the investigative focus of individuals within a specific program. But what else could we expect from a field that is mostly intelligible only from the waste generated by its melancholic, to reference Paul Gilroy, but deliberate autophagia? I recall the glee on the face of a would-be Marxist, and for me, all Marxists are would-be, <laughs> when he told me about Vivek Chibber's post-colonial theory and the specter of capital and the fact that with it, post-colonial theory is really finally done. But here is the deal. Even though I don't locate my work there anymore, I don't have scorn or contempt. Again, without the weaknesses or limitations of its hybrid partial post-structuralist and partial Marxist methodology, my own work may never have emerged. Therefore, I'll focus on three moments or places in which reading with and against postcolonial theory opened up my <coughs> spaces for my work on indigeneity and blackness before turning concretely to what that looks like. <coughs> the first is the nation. In graduate school, we read the usual suspects and I was invited to see the nation primarily in terms of its discursivity. This is what post-structuralism bequeathed to postcolonial theory. <coughs> The nation was that cultural sphere that could be apprehended in terms of its modes of writing and or representation, even where it was only the uneasy, un uneasy congealing of a set of fragments. So here, think Partha Chatterjee, Homi Baba, etc. <coughs> Our work as postcolonial theorists became about locating the nation, and as such, its fragments were nothing less than the expression of a proper relation to it. However, my problem was that this was prefaced on the assumption that all post-colonial cultures wrote or articulated themselves in terms that could always be apprehended. So I began to wonder about the field in terms of what it was translating rather than reading and how this incessant legibility function obscured the settler state and its relation to indigeneity. The second area is subjectivity. <coughs> If one follows Gayatri Spivak, it is the legal, quote, legal subject of socialized capital, end quote, that actually circulates in the post-colonial text because the Western academic is always already in the other side of the global division of labor. As such, she cannot hope to represent Spivak's subaltern. In part, at least as I see it, subjectivity in post-colonial studies is rendered <coughs> in terms only of a positive or negative relationship to the market that market that institutes itself, according to Foucault, on the scale of the world in order for raison d'etat to be realized at the level of the biologized population. So post-colonial theory is limited by the always already of a relation to liberal subjecthood in terms, again, of success or failure, the latter of which is actually a partial completion or inhabiting. Those subject posi positions that can't be read in terms of this, Spivak subaltern, enslaved and post-slavery blacks, indigenous peoples and settler states are simply ignored. Moreover, while the post-colonial might account for speech <coughs> or, its it, or its inability to be heard, it cannot account for non-being unless it could be co-opted as Fanon was in the post-colonial studies reader as phenomenological, and that was in the first edition of the post-colonial studies reader. And incidentally, I think that, um, I always think of Fanon in terms of two readings, right? There's a phenomenological Fanon, that's the terrain of post-colonial, primarily, and the ontological, which is the terrain of Afro-pessimism and uh, black existentialism. The third and, of course, related area is the critique of capital. Ella Shohat and a host of others fault postcolonial theory because of the way in which it disappears the formal relation to capital that the term third world, problematic as it was, encapsulated. As a supersession of third world, too indebted to its post-structuralist elements, there have been calls for it to be replaced by neo-colonial and post-independence so that it can now finally properly index the political and economic relation it signals and better express the continuity, continuity and relationality of struggles. For Chibber, it has failed entirely to have an effective critique or even account of capital because it inherited the errors of subaltern studies in the over-representation of ideology. In doing so, it can't actually properly address the role of the working classes or masses <coughs> in anti and post-independence history because it ascribes to the bourgeois class in India, for example, a world historical role that he claims bourgeois classes have never had. In his critique of Ranjit Guha 
and Partha Chatterty and others, he takes these writers to task for what I'll call their misuse and misunderstanding of the universalizing tendency of capital. <clears throat> abstract labor, coercion, interest, history, etc. He also claims that Marx does account for racial and ethnic heterogene heterogeneity in the labor force, which post-colonial interventions try to recover. In other words, post-colonial <coughs> theorists read into Marx a kind of Orientalism, so think Derelict here, that was never for Chivac, uh, for Chibber ever there. While I found Chibber's claims compelling, and it did make me rethink to some extent how we talk about the Caribbean middle classes, I could not help but note the repetition in his claims. When we read, when we read Can the Subaltern Speak, Ride, and Later Dance, and I'm serving on a committee with a student working on Sing, I couldn't help but think that Chibber's work perfectly expressed not a difference from post-colonial theory, but its organizing trope and method of expression repetition. Put differently, he could have developed a reading of working class history in India that did not center post-colonial studies, but he did. So post-colonial theory, as far as I see it, and maybe to the dismay of that colleague I mentioned earlier, the would-be Marxist, is not actually dead. It's just in the rinse cycle of a perpetual wash. <laughs> this endless repetition means that Chibber too inscribes the subject in terms of a relation to the world historical. This is clear when he critiques the post-colonial idea that the subaltern worker has no interests and is only motivated by loyalty to community. By contrast, he says, that the only way wealthier subalterns could have emerged was if they actually had interests. The subaltern is thus always already the would-be liberal subject, the would-be legal subject of global capital, to return to Spivak, and for Denise de Silva, the would-be transparent subject always seeking to move out of the state of affectability. This left me again thinking about, in somewhat Heideggerian terms, the proper relation to capital that the post-colonial subject must have in terms either of an inhabiting or an imminence. These are the only two positions captured by the post-colonial in general. And so those who express a different relation to it can't be factored in. And this is the true limit of critiques of capital routed through the field proper. For all its focus on discourse, postcolonial theory has never actually dealt with what it means to exist, as Sylvia Winter argues, homo narens, beings who are able to rewrite our genetic codes, rewrite our very flesh, beings who are <coughs> able to realize ourselves as human, not through those genetic codes alone, but through, as she puts it, quote, narratively instituted conceptions of itself, and thereby the culture-specific discursive programs to which these conceptions give rise, end quote. It does not deal with the way in which the privileging of the liberal subject is part and parcel of that mimetic desire for whiteness as a relation to the market, part and parcel of the overriding of our biology that asks us to always see ourselves in terms of a consumptive relation to capital and its aesthetics. It is precisely our capacity to rewrite ourselves in Winter's terms that is the one writing post-colonial theory is incapable of apprehending because it is not a repetition but an inscription. What, however, and I should do that. What, however, I think postcolonial theory has to offer in this regard is precisely what <coughs> is conceived of as its central flaw: the enduring methodolog methodological tension between structure Marxism and post-structuralism, sign narrative subjectivity, between, as Winter would say, structure and anti-structure. When we operate on either side of the tension to the exclusion of the other we repeat its founding presuppositions with regard to the market and the subject. For example, when postcolonial studies follows the precepts of Marxism, for instance, it ignores the way in which economics functions as a, a quote, teleological economic script, end quote, for which economics is the master narrative or discipline of homo economicus. It ignores the way in which Marxism reproduces the fallacy that, um, and I'm gonna quote Winter from her essay, Neil Humans Involved here, our human behaviors are motivated primarily by the imperative. Um, let me see. I think, yeah. Our human behaviors are motivated primarily by the imperative common to all organic species of securing the material basis of their existence, rather than by imper the imperative of securing the overall conditions of existence of each local culture's representation, represented conception of the self. When it follows the precepts of post-structuralism, on the other hand, Postcolonial studies comes closer to revealing the mechanisms of subjectivity 
but still can't address how the above actually works as a condition of possibility for its inscription of capitals or subject who then manipulates signs like nation, culture, etc. But when postcolonial studies fails at the material and post-structuralist criti post-structural critiques, that's precisely where I think it still has the unrealized potential to walk us back from both precipices and move beyond repetition into an otherwise, an otherwise rather than an in addition to difference. In my work in graduate school, I did as I was instructed and turned to the nation as a cultural or symbolic tapestry. But as I progressed, what became clear was its hieroglyphic dependence on a relation to capital and its actor homo economicus, which could not explain the intimacies of the nation's fragments that I've mentioned before. <coughs> that intimacy is, as I describe in the preface of my first book, the closing of the shades and turning off of the radio that my family did every day when I was little at the moment the moments when other parts of our blood surfaced, um, such as our South Asian ancestry. And so um, it's precisely when South Asian music would come on the radio, my family would just turn off the radio. Uh, so that's one example. <coughs> it was the naming of my great grandmother that was not a naming, but a marking off of an intimate difference, in this case, a sexual relation of black and indigenous bodies. And uh, there I simply mean we refer to her as Lady Buck because of her, it's a pejorative term and it refers to her black and indigenous origins. Um, and so that's the intimacy that I'm talking about. It was the attempt to excavate these intimacies that led me to work with, through and against post-colonial theory, settler colonial studies, indigenous black and South Asian studies, in order to bring into focus what we were never, <coughs> relations that were never fragments and always global rather than singularly national. So what I'd like to do now is share an argument from my current work around labor and the kind of space clearing I hope to affect there, which is also a way of moving, as Sylvia Winter would say, quote, beyond the absolutism of our present economic categories, end quote, and their modes of inscription, beyond structure as the completion of structure. It is a space clearing that for me leads to another account of history, particularly labor history, and of the subjects within it. So this is the non-postcolonial part. <coughs> Much of my earlier work focused on the marginalization of indigenous peoples in the Caribbean, particularly Guyana. What I observed is how the descendants of the formerly enslaved and indentured, collectively called Creoles, claimed belonging and rights to the postcolonial colonial nation state by the fact of their progenitors having performed modern labor upon the land, on the plantation. In contrast, indigenous peoples were subject to a persistent narrative which holds that they didn't do that kind of formative modern work to any real degree, and so that they weren't true workers for the modern nation. They also have a frequently have a kind of development discourse thrown, uh, directed at them. This is true for the Caribbean and even to some extent for the Latin American settler states, though Bolivia changes the calculus on this somewhat. Even where indigenous peoples such as the Maya in Cancun are the overwhelming majority of workers in particular industries, and experience what M. Bionet Castellanos calls a return to servitude, the nation is never an inheritance of theirs. Theirs is not a labor for the nation or one that results in a kind of completion or, in completion or inhabiting of the dominant positions socially or politically. So while for Creoles, the nation is a patrimony of the labor of their ancestors in the colonial period and their own organized labor in the early 20th century, Indigenous labor, in contrast, has no such, no such terminus and is thus a kind of failure. It's a failure that manages the threat of their status as both internal citizens and extra sovereigns. Where they are the former, their lack of productivity actually serves to confirm their inability to be captured by the telos of modern capital. Where they are the latter, the failure is part of what limits their internal sovereignty because it always signals the underdevelopment of their own sovereign spaces. And that's actually something that um, the under, supposed underdevelopment of indigenous space is something that I think Vine Deloria Jr. notes in uh, Custer Died for Your Sins. What strikes me about all of this is that in the 21st century, we don't have a real way of talking about the actual work that indigenous peoples have done and continue to do in the Caribbean. We don't have a way of thinking about their labor outside of the need to manage it. So this is what my current project is focused on and what I'd like to talk about today. How and why did indigenous people's labor disappear before and maybe in connection with the largely, largely regional explanation 
that they perished. And then, how can we recover or read their histories of work as and in regional labor history? What I'm working towards is a kind of method for reading labor and labor history in the region in such a way that indigeneity can actually be centrally figured rather than on placed on the margin. My talk thus re-examines the reasons for disappearance and draws attention to distinctions around work and labor. Um, <coughs> and I'm aware that that distinction might be sacrilegious for Marxian orthodox orthodoxies and post-structuralist heterodoxies, but we're gonna let that alone. The standard narrative of disappearance in the Caribbean is that black enslaved peoples were brought in to replace indigenous peoples who had perished. Hence, most regional and country specific histories reiterate this fact. Um, and also, of course, then our labor histories reiterate the same thing. So you can read, um, you can read Eric Williams, you can read C.L.R. James, it's, they're all there. This essentially sets up a prepositional relationship between blacks and indigenous peoples. And here I mean prepositional in <coughs> two senses. First, the temporal preposition of indigenous peoples to blacks because they perished after they perished. And in terms of a grammar in which as a unified part of speech, the prepositional phrase must express something about the noun and in this instance completes its meaning. So the subject blacks and black labor, for instance, can't elaborate by itself. So it seeks a kind of fullness and a causality that always signals its success rather than failure. Our history is dependent upon this relationship, this grammar, in which the labors of blacks, Indians, and native peoples can't exist within the same time, and now only exist in the substitution of being non-being, now based on life, death, uh, productive or non-productive, for cosmogonic belonging. The problem then becomes, how do you read together two labors that can't operate in the same time, because they are now expressed via biopolitical relation rather than on their own terms? To attempt such a reading, I return to a core historical moment in which the region's divergent histories were initiated together, and that is the moment or concept of conversion. It is within the single Christian monarchic <coughs> imperative that both black and indigenous peoples first link up in the 15th and 16th centuries. And it is this moment to which I turn as an optic that moves us beyond the disarticulations of lives, histories, and rights across the time space of the Americas. Generally, we think of conversion as a religious phenomenon, the indoctrination into and acceptance of another faith. It frames the push for discovery in the 15th century. <coughs> However, as an opening within which to posit the relatedness of black and indigenous New World labor, I want to suggest that conversion within which all labors are potentially, all potential labors rather than actual labors are for God, encapsulates the beginning of a new labor history for the Caribbean that stretches the concept of labor within and beyond the Marxist tradition. And there I'm um, just kind of playing with Banan. Before I get into the discussion, however, I need to say that I'm going to use labor and work to index different things. I borrow their distinction from Hannah Arendt uh, <coughs> when in a circumcised, circumscribed criticism of Marx in The Human Condition, she reframes human activity into three areas. And there are problems with Arendt, but I'm not gonna go into them there, uh, them here. What's important for me is her positioning of labor as life itself, what we need to do to reproduce ourselves, and her framing of work as that which, quote, provides an artificial world of things distinctly different from all natural surroundings, end quote. What I find useful is the way in which the definitions create space for thinking about the actions or labors that indigenous peoples and blacks do for themselves versus the work they must do for Europeans. So here I will use these two terms and I want you to keep the distinction in mind. It's a terminological break that I think is one way of approaching and making visible the way in which the constant reinscription of liberal subjectivity in post-colonial studies belies the mimetic desire for whiteness, and this is a winter, um, as a relation to class and as an expression of genetically uh, redeemed status in the capture of all of our labors as and through work. <laughs> in his first letter to the sovereigns, Ferdinand and Isabella about the new world, Columbus writes, and I gave a thousand handsome good things in order that they might strive to aid us and to give us of the things which they have in abundance and which are necessary to us. Here, he reproduces a discursive economy within which he identifies indigenous peoples with, surplus, with a surplus of resources, while he essentially identifies Europeans with scarcity and needs. 
Twice in the letter, he refers to indigenous lands and peoples as innumerable or without number, again associating their bodies with abundance and excess, which he subordinates to European needs so that the labor indigenous peoples do to produce their own innum innumerability can't actually be read as such. In every instance in which indigenous peoples labor is referenced, either through direct physical action witnessed by Columbus or the products of such, it is always already subordinated to a language external to them at within which they are positioned in terms of the dialectic of abundance and scarcity. Thus, labor, <coughs> thus their labor for themselves at, as that which occurred within the mandate of their own cosmogonic narratives and the social political systems that ensued from them becomes misread in terms of what is necessary for European survival. <coughs> so in terms of things, objects, work. And as an aside, what I think happens is that when enslaved blacks eventually uh, are eventually imported, they come to be associated with needs rather than scarcity, um, with needs and scarcity rather than abundance so that their labor is always on the other side of the dialectic. Indigenous peoples labor for themselves, that labor which if one follows a rent is not work, is immediately understood as excess because it is being read against or through the scarcity that attains because of the sea voyages to the new worlds, the precarious unstable microcosm the caravels represent, as well as the mandate Columbi Columbus had to find spices and precious metals for a monarchy <coughs> whose resources had been depleted by the nearly eight century long Reconquista and for a Europe, and I know the term is anachronous here, but I'll just keep using it. <laughs> Uh, that is eager to find new trade routes after the fall of Constantinople to the Turks in 1453. It is through the lens of this collective and sustained scarcity that in the letters Columbus records, that is translates, what he observes of indigenous labor. So for example, he says they quote, carry their goods, uh, end quote, or the products of their labor. What for him in that instance is always already their work. What Columbus is seeing and not seeing is indigenous labor and the products of that labor, neither of which are part of the European feudal and early capitalist follower, um, <laughs> sort of the emergence of the early origins of capital in Marx, um, but neither of which are part of these economies of which Columbus is representative. Reading in a rather counterintuitive way then, Columbus's letters in fact record an extant new world labor history, a history in which a parallel mode of action, specifically indigenous labor, is always already read through what I refer to as its conversion within and to the global economies that will emerge from this encounter. So within and to work, and eventually as work, failure. Near the end of his first letter, Columbus invokes conversion as the overarching justification for his voyage, when he writes that he will seek permission from the sovereigns for the, quote, conversion to our holy fate, end quote, of the peoples he has encountered. This need to convert newly discovered peoples in order to extend the Christian social and political order of Europe is a well-known part of the logic deployed to justify conquest of new lands and enslavement of indigenous peoples. It is this logic, however, that the Dominican friar Bartolome de las Casas famously challenged when he argued in the 16th century that indigenous peoples, though subordinate and fallen, should not be enslaved like the Negros of Guinea, that's mentioned in Columbus's letters, but should be made vassals of the crown. The desire to convert the newly encountered peoples to Christianity comes from both Columbus's letters and Las Casas, who transcribed and edited, edited Columbus's travel, lo Columbus travel logs. It was, however, Las Casas who would question religious conversion as the justification for Spanish abuses of indigenous peoples and recognize, according to Winter, quote, the relatively, uh, relativity of all human systems of perception, end quote. As a theological shift that disconnects earthly material gain from Christian spiritual gain, Las Casas' conversion is purportedly signally responsible for the mass introduction of blacks as slaves in the New World. His conversion becomes the poetic apori that places indigenous peoples and blacks on the opposite side of New World's work. Blacks must do the physical work for material gain, and indigenous peoples, no matter what work they do building missions and in their continued work for the Spanish colonies, are rele relegated to spiritual labors. Their labor for themselves, like that of blacks, is actually now antecedent. But the conversion of Las Casas that resulted in, in the importation of enslaved, <coughs> of enslaved blacks worked not singularly because it found a more reliable and renewable labor source. It worked because it froze indigenous action in time space, they were thereby rendering it invisible, whether it manifested as labor for their own well-being or work for the continued well-being of the European cultural economic system that came to supplant their own. In other words, 
While the conversion is identified as Las Casas' own, in which he could recognize indigenous semi-humanity vis-a-vis the infra-humanity of Africans below Bujador, it is actually the fulfillment of that original conversion achieved by Columbus in the discursive economy that rendered indigenous labor invisible against the needs, scarcity of Europe. Under Las Casas, indigenous work as a supersession of their labor is again rendered invisible against the scarcity experienced by Europe, but this time it is spiritual rather than material scarcity. When Sylvia Winter writes about Las Casas and the exchange of indigenous <coughs> for black labor, she says that he's not here proposing the substitution of white and black slaves for Indian slaves per se, but instead the substitution of men and women who can be categorized as justly enslaved within the system of classification legi legitimated by Spanish Christian doctrine for a group of enslaved men and women who cannot be so classified. As those who cannot now be justly enslaved, indigenous peoples can no longer perform just work. In other words, their work can no longer be understood <coughs> or extracted within the new and increasingly secular governing <coughs> logic of the Indies and hence its modes of production. the work of indigenous peoples thus disappears along with the indigenous body in the Caribbean in particular, but not singularly because of the poetics of extinction that dominates the region, as we are led to believe. It disappears because of its delinking from the category of just unfree work and its permanent suture with the religious ontological function of the discoveries. The development of the plantation mode of production allowed blacks to outstrip this suture, whereas the substitution of the repartimiento for the encomienda did not do the same for indigenous peoples. This is the real significance of what Winter writes when she says that the exchange of blacks for Indians was not the same. Both groups continue to work for European humanity, but that work is not only understood and articulated differently, it is ideologically divergent in the religious secular dialectic that produces blacks and indigenous peoples together as modern subjects. <coughs> in spite of this, I think that if we reread Las Casas' writings as a chronicle of both the religious and economic conversions of indigenous peoples, <coughs> what we can see in it and maybe recover are two parallel modes of indigenous labor and work, one which links up with the work of enslaved blacks and one which does not. In his short account of the destruction of the Indies in their various titles, um, Las Casas writes that indigenous peoples are naturally predisposed to receive the Catholic faith because of their docile and kind natures. Not only are indigenous peoples as docile bodies unsuited to function as slaves, and docile I think is an older translation, but they seem to live in a paradise, paradise that itself requires no work because of its fertility. Las Casas describes the lands of the islands as, quote, more fertile and more beautiful than the royal gardens in Seville, end quote. In spite of this paradise, he does note, however, that indigenous peoples are supplying Europeans with food and that one European consumes the amount of three indigenous families in a single day. Later, when he speaks of the gold-rich province of Santa Marta, he writes that its native inhabitants had, quote, the will and the know-how to extract, end quote, gold. In all of the preceding instances, indigenous peoples are either laboring for themselves, and this is what is behind their supposed innumerability, or working for Europeans, but both are misread because they are presented in terms of the European voracious capacity for such. At every moment in which native labor or work, and I'm going to index them together here, rises to the foreground in Las Casas, it is necessarily <coughs> subordinated not by not only the view of them as docile, but the capture of their labor, labor and work as excess for European need, a capture that renders it again into failed work. Within Las Casas' own documents, there's ample evidence not only of not only work for the Spanish, but pre-contact indigenous labor that proceeds and is concurrent with it. If we read against the grain, we can see in Las Casas' descriptions the labor work required to obtain the food for the Spanish that the Spanish needed in the first place the labor work that populated the islands with kingdoms, each of which Las Casas claimed was larger than the Iberian Peninsula. Throughout his writings, indigenous peoples labor for themselves and hence within their own modes of production is either misread as excess or as work for Europeans. A clear example is of the gourds, which Las Casas says an indigenous king ordered filled with gold to be gifted to the Spanish sovereigns. This is not work in the mines for Europeans, but labor for native well-being, which results in a product that is then presented to Europeans. 
The gold is, in other words, fully produced within a native economy, not a European one, but here it is read only as a kind of surplus within Euro European social economic <laughs> systems. There are thus two parallel economies in which indigenous peoples actually labor and work. There is again the one in which they labor <coughs> for themselves and live in cities and towns that support a dense population. And then there's the one in which indigenous peoples were not only traded for goods, but were forced to work in mining, agriculture, shipbuilding, and in carrying the possessions of Europeans. While both are eclipsed in Caribbean labor history, this latter work, which is the work also of European settler colonialism, allows only two outcomes, both of which reveal something about the conversion of indigenous labor to work. The first outcome is the subordination of indigenous people's well-being to the European economy that is at this moment using both money, coins, and barter, and is graphically represented, for instance, in the image of indigenous women being forced to abandon infants on the side of the road because they could not carry both their children and the Spanish possessions. Another example recorded by Las Casas lies in his claim about the inspector of Indian affairs who, finding no gold, told indigenous people in Mihuacan that they could find gold and silver and use these to buy back their confiscated idols, idols which those under the tutelage of the friars they had been told to burn because they were false. The transformation of the idols into goods with a measurable value exemplifies the translation of indigenous labor to a European economy where it can now serve European needs. It is the capture of indigenous labor for European well-being as a function of the market. The second outcome is one that is tied to Las Casas' <coughs> conversion and the only way in which he reads their actual work. At one point, he mentions indigenous peoples building churches for the friars who are teaching them the word of God. Las Casas may see this as labor because the object is transcendent, cosmogonic, and it does not produce those things that are clearly the earthly needs of Europeans, such as the soldiers and governors make them do. Labor for well-being in God becomes contrasted in Las Casas to work for the earthly well-being of Europeans, which in his short account reads a, he reads as destructive. Because the church seeks to capture indigenous pre-conquest labor as its own, however, they are already subject to conversion and their pre-conquest pre labor for themselves, for their own well-being, is in fact a kind of work for God, the parallel of the market that can't be read as such. It is therefore from both these conversions, God and market, that I suggest indigenous people's work must be read back into regional histories of the development of capital rather than excluding, excluded, um, starting with the middle passage. The middle passage and all its attendant economies is what converted blacks into valuable labor. It is a formative stage in primitive <coughs> accumulation. For me, it's important to foreground, however, what the middle passage does rather than just who crosses. It strips the black indigenous body of its cosmogonic belonging and it adds value, embedding it within a different economy, a process that renders, <coughs> that is rendered in Sadia Hartman's Lose Your Mother as the ne necessary death that blacks underwent in order to become chattel. And it is this passage, this death that indigenous peoples are seen as not having undergone. Their death was eliminatory if we follow Patrick Wolf, and I know a lot of the arguments against that, and produce land, not a new body. Even, for instance, where Las Casas notes that over one million indigenous peoples were forcibly relocated and sold into slavery, they seemingly lacked this middle passage or process of adding value to their persons because they are always already seen as too weak to work. They can only labor for God. Ron Welburn, who is of Cherokee, Asatig, Lenape, and African-American descent, argues that this capture and enslavement should in fact be read as an, uh, quote, other middle passage, end quote, which he distinguishes from, the practice of, distinguishes from the practice of Indian removal in North America. Building on, in, on Wellborn and in dialogue with Jace Weaver's The Red Atlantic, what I want to suggest is that the forci forcible relocation of indigenous peoples <coughs> to work, both physical and metaphysical, is not only a middle passage in the Caribbean, but it is indeed a prior or foundational middle passage. It is a middle passage that links Africa and the Caribbean and what would become the Americas and it is formative for how those territories will come to look and what populations they will have in the future. The problem we have is that indigenous peoples are linked with conversion, a process that we can reframe as extractive or devaluing, while blacks are linked with the middle passage, again, a process that is adding value. Adding value. These twin poles of the Atlantic economy function to separate black and indigenous work. 
I think, however, it is important to recognize that both blacks and indigenous peoples are embedded in processes of conversion, of adding and subtracting value. Just as both are involved in middle passages that orient around conversion or the ability to be converted from and to something. Conversion should, just be under, should thus be understood as a point of entanglement of indigenous labor with new world economies, even as their facilitator beyond just the theft of land. It is thus as foundational for European modernity as the African Middle Passage and should be read along with that as a history of indigenous work within modernity and for the rise of capital. And now a caveat. It must, however, also be read alongside the history of indigenous labor for their own well-being as that which is prior and runs parallel to the Middle Passage transformations of labor. These tandem movements of indigenous peoples around work in the Americas represent both a Middle Passage that is already the Caribbean Sea and another passage, which is always the translation of a parallel that forces us to rethink the normative ends and beginnings of labor history in the region. Understanding the complex nature of conversion in the new world is what allows us to begin reading black lab indigenous labor back into Caribbean history as not only the history of a forgotten Atlantic, but of the first Atlantic and a parallel mode of work that is contiguous and continuous. Rethinking conversion, however, as a kind of Atlantic middle passage is only a point of departure, a place to <coughs> recognize the centrality of indigenous people's labor to our conceptions of the Atlantic as a machine to reference Antonio Benitez Rojo, and also recognizing their labor that is not work. We still have to deal with the weight of regional labor history in which indigenous labor history is absent. But if we return to that, return to that record and read for this labor work divide and for conversion, we can undo the causal link between labor, the labor as work rights relation. So you labor for this land, therefore you have rights to it. Um, that reproduces the post-colonial state as an outcome of a singular effort. We can introduce a pause between the plantation and its modes of work labor and the post-colonial state's capture of it. Moreover, if we reread the radical tradition in the Caribbean in terms of the space between labor and work, we can introduce, the kind of, introduce a kind of imminence that allows us to foreground the ways in which the post-colonial state, as an inheritance of the colonial state, has a prior existent in existence in terms of a not yet becoming of black and indigenous, and indigenous labor. This imminence or not yet is the capture of indig indigeneity against the futurity of the settler state, and it allows us to see the ways in which the political economy of the Caribbean contains within <coughs> it rather than units of production, units of being, existence, labor that are fundamentally interruptive. Global capitalism and its logics force us to relate to ourselves as and, 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 as and as not yet fully inscribed, as superior subordinate, and thus forces us to read for our work. Whenever we wake up, we perform the labor of breathing, moving, eating, necessary to life, but it, always, it is always subsumed by the capture of our work and our ability to purchase the shampoos, body washes, and colognes with which we perfume our labors and in so doing obscure them. If we skip over the break between the two, between labor and work, or operate at the level of their biopolitical consolidation, we remain, as Winter suggests, just as stuck as the theologians who didn't think that the earth moved. We must reject the ways in which capital and its super narrative, as she says, traps us in the mimetic model of Western bourgeois liberal monohumanist man and its capture of original sin as natural scarcity, where the global, <coughs> where the goal of higher standards of living continuously force us to relate to ourselves again <coughs> as biological rather than continuously enacting a script that is the limit of both what we know and how we know it. Reading our histories for rather than against this tension between work and labor pushes us beyond the limits of emancipatory politics and towards the possibilities of sovereign ones that demand a more expansive historical account of all of our labors and not just some of our work. Thank you. So I think I understand that we take questions. Yes. Thank you so much. <coughs> Historically, Creoles were um, Afro and Euro Caribbeans and that whole continuum. And 
window carabines were outside. So could you say more about the pre-organization hmm. of window carabines, you know, vis-a-vis, -vis, I guess, the people who pre well, who came after indigenous people? So that is something that I deal with in my first book, which I refuse to read ever again. <laughs> um, <laughs> I really do. But um, so when indo caribbeans came during the indenture period, um, they were held or housed in the same structures that had once occupied the, the enslaved population who had been leaving the plantation to form villages and whatnot. Um, and they had their own sort of cultural units. Um, the conditions of their transport were not, were not the same. Uh, and so in the Caribbean, a sort of fissure emerged uh, where they saw themselves as fundamentally different from formerly enslaved blacks. Formerly enslaved bl blacks either had no culture or they assimilated European culture, um, whereas Indians could point to a cultural a past that was actually not a past, right? Because it was constantly being enacted. Um, and so th there is that there is there is that difference. Um, they, I think, eventually come to work primarily in the rice industry, um, whereas blacks had worked in sugarcane and different things. But what you see, um, what you see across the, the 20th century, especially after the end of indenture, is the narration of Indian work on the former plantation as something that, for at least for Guyana, saved the colony. Um, and so even while there was a sense of a cultural distinctiveness from blacks, which would eventually, of course, evolve um, as they became more Creole um, without you know, greater renewals of, uh, of Indian culture, even where that distinctiveness emerged, they began to model belonging in the same terms that blacks had modeled their belonging which was a specific relation to the land based on labor and what would allow the land to, uh, as colony, eventually be understood as a home. Um, and in many ways, th there's no other choice, right? You're hoping to inherit the nation. You're hoping um, eventually, you know, we move towards independence and who's going to hold the key spots at independence. Um, but again, despite the breaks between blacks uh, and Indians, they both undergo a, a sort of creolizing process that allows them to see the land as theirs by the fact of them having performed modern labor on the land. So. Yes? Um, Can you speak up just a touch? <laughs> Oh, um, no, I mean, if you follow a rent, um, you are always performing some kind of labor. Um, what happens is, though, and, and so I think I had assigned the Sylvia Winter reading, uh, <coughs> the interview with Catherine McKittrick. What happens, though, is that um, Europe is go undergoing a huge change, and I could, I could s try to summarize the change, and I will do that if you want me to, but Europe is undergoing a huge change, and it begins to have a sort of more and more consumptive relationship um, to the world. And that consumptive relationship requires not other labors, but it requires work. It requires work from enslaved blacks, and it requires work from indigenous peoples. Um, so that has to do with the mode of production that is emerging, not, the, not, not, that it, uh, not Europeans not having their own labors. Um, additionally, the prior to the slave trade in certain parts of the Americas, the first people that were brought in were actually indentured whites from Europe. Uh, whites, obviously not whites, because they weren't white. <laughs> Uh, racially at that moment, um, but that labor source just it uh, became outstripped. It would just uh, became outstripped, and so it led to to other 
uh, to other groups being brought in. Yes. Mm-hmm. You said something about wanting to move beyond structure as if you mm. didn't feel like structure? I no. Anti, I, I think I said something like... I was just curious about that, that, that moment in which you're making the transition. I was curious about that. that uh, yeah, I think I said something like anti-structure as the completion of structure. I was simply trying to suggest that they were always in a kind of relation. So that while we might critique post-colonial studies, um, you know, because it has to do with the two poles of critique of post-colonial studies. Um, that uh, so post-colonial methodologies, um, you know, or on the one hand, post-structure, um, and on the other hand, they also have to be structure. They have to be Marxist at the same time. Um, and what I was simply saying is that those things aren't necessarily opposed, but they're always already in a kind of relation to each other. Uh, because they both sort of work to, in a sense, produce a kind of subject um, that is pr- sort of precisely the problem. Yes. Um, you said at the beginning of the talk that your, in your research, you were inspired by MPCs and musicians of Toronto. Uh. All was global rather than Um, because the post-colonial is so obsessed with the nation, so you have post-colonial literatures, um, <coughs> which again have, are being displaced by many other things. Um, because of that, what happens is that over and over, we are meant to think precisely in terms of the nation, right? Precisely in terms of the post-independent state. What that did for me, it it simply did not explain. It forced it sort you know so it it forced me to sort of go to the um, the political economic theorists in the region, and they would talk a lot about you know class and ethnicity and race, Um, but those were all concepts that would refer back to the nation and to the nation's proper subjects. And so what I found was that if we kept looking at the nation as a sort of unit of analysis, if we can't looked at the nation a- in terms of how it was discursively elaborated, um, we couldn't see particular bodies and histories within it. Um, again, particular histories of labor and work. Um, but we also, it took our attention away from the global. It took our attention from attention away from the way in which blackness and indigeneity are actually constructed at the level of at the level of the global rather than the local. So I hope that answers your question. I think I have a follow up question. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so if they're constructed globally, does this mean that the indigenous structures of black subjects and the indigenous black subjects themselves do not see themselves through? I think we are forced into seeing ourselves as national, right? Every time we're reminded to vote, I've gotten a million reminders to vote, and I will be voting. Um, (laughs) uh, I got a sign out on my lawn, but anyway. Every time that we are reminded about voting, for instance, that's always in relation to the national. Um, And post-colonial subjects, I think, over and over are invited to see ourselves as national subjects because the nation is a liberatory uh, uh, phenomenon, right? Um, It is what allows us to um, inhabit inhabit a sort of dominant position with regard to subjecthood, um, as opposed to if you're not a nation state and you're just some small polity. Um, And then, so, the 
And in part, I think we have to sort of look outside, we have to begin to look outside of that and what it, ma what it masks, but more than what it masks, what it makes normal, right? It normalizes certain relationships with regard to uh, life, work, labor, and we're meant to see those as entirely natural. Uh, we're meant to see the idea of belonging uh, as a citizen to a settler state as just completely natural. And so that's what the nation sort of constantly reinforces um, and sort of replays for us. Come in where? Um, the concept of nationhood, which you just mentioned, and like, uh, giving up the traditional rights. Or do you think, um, do you think their perceived ownership of land as well would, uh, would come from some sort of labor of them? Hmm. Um, so that's an interesting question. So let me cl clarify the first part. Um, I, and so again, I outlined this in that book that I refuse to read again. Um, I have a, a chapter, which is the titular chapter, uh, Creole Indigeneity, and what I talk about is the way in which um, that in becoming Creole, right, as opposed to former uh, African peoples or former Indian uh, peoples, in becoming Creole, uh, indigenous, and, I'm sorry, um, Indians and blacks uh, articulated sought in some way to themselves become indigenous and at this and in this really strange way both become indigenous and also simultaneously have a possess a possessive relationship to the land that's that comes out of um, the out of colonialism um, so that's one whether or not um, Europeans and their descendants have a relationship to the land you're asking that that also, um, that is one of work, not just possessiveness. Yeah, always, yeah. yeah it's, always, it's always both. We have hardworking Americans. <laughs> we have hardworking American families. Um, and that we're never, we're never asked to actually analyze that work that we're doing. We don't really look at it. Um, but both narratives operate. Um, possession and then, of course, work that transforms the land into something valuable. Yes? Um, I had a, uh, one of my advisors um, in undergrad was an archeologist who specialized in Mayan and in Belize, mm -hmm. and a local black population descended from slaves um, had taken ownership over a site of Mayan remains and actually implanted their own histories onto it. They saw it as a ritualized space, mm -hmm. even though they were supposed to acknowledge that it was there before them, but they um, they took it, they felt it very akin to who they were as people. And I was wondering mm -hmm. if that was something that was common throughout um, Central and South America and Caribbean, or if it was if, uh, if this is kind of just a one-off. So in the Caribbean, you have different um, you have the descendants of the plantation proper, and I hate to say it that way, but it's, um, it's easier to do. Um, you have those descendants, people who deliberately trace their labor through the plantation, um, and then you, know, you have communities that evolve from that. But what you also have are a lot of maroon communities. Um, so the maroons uh, in Jamaica, for instance, uh, you have maroon communities that were displaced multiple times, like the Garifuna, in um, in Belize, mm -hmm. and so the I believe that in the s one of the UN declarations, the rights of maroon groups are treated similarly to uh, are, are treated in a similar way or as approximate to the rights of indigenous peoples. Mm -hmm. um, the these groups have histories that are divergent from the plantation. And 
their modes of indigenizing are not then through a specific relationship to modern labor. Um, their, their modes of indigenizing, their modes of belonging. Uh, so I'd, these aren't necessarily one-offs because these communities actually exist. And then the issue becomes, how do we also recognize them as, in, as indigenous peoples who are on the lands of indigenous peoples and who remain in perpetual conflict with the indigenous peoples who they share that land with. Uh, and the, the, the Maya Garifuna situation in Belize, I think had gotten really complicated and funky. Um, and there was a partial reconciliation at a conference I, I was at in 2017 in Trinidad um, where um, the head of a Mayan alliance and the head of um, uh, a sort of a Garifuna community, they sort of met and tried to get around that. But it is a, it is a, it is a huge problem um, and we can't, we can't skip over it. I don't know if we want to call them neo-indigenous peoples. I They're called tribal peoples in the neo language. Yeah, and that's also a term that I stay away from. Oh. Yeah, I love, I love uh, Chinua Chebe's Things Fall Apart because he only uses that word tribe one time at mm -hmm. the end, and it's to deliver deliberately reference the way that uh, s social systems, kin systems, are literally re-read or and mistranslated or rewritten within European um, uh, documents. But yes, yes, yeah. Um, uh, yeah. And I also, I don't know if the Garifuna have exactly the same status as Maroon communities in, let's say, Suriname and other places. I'm not sure, I don't know that they have the same status. Yeah, because they're seen as less... Yeah, they're seen as immigrants are less, uh, less authentic, but that's, again, because they had been moved so many times. But they are Afro-Indigenous, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. they're Carib and Arawak. They are, yes. So they mm -hmm. have a different sort of status. They have a different status, but it's still quite different from, like, Indigenous status, mm -hmm. Maya status, et cetera. And so it's this a, a long-running source of tension and conflict. Um, yeah, so I think post-colonial studies has gotten a bad rap. <laughs> um, there are always these, traject these trajectories that sort of move away from it and then don't, don't necessarily refer back to it concretely. Um, so... Yeah, I'm not sure how to answer the question. I mean, I suppose my work is in is one of these trajectories. I, I'm not sure exactly if you're asking about a specific. I guess the question is a little bit about the kind of, so you just said there are all these trajectories that kind of move away from like something like post-colonial studies proper or whatever. And yeah. I'm a little stuck on that question because I could be like that. Um, or what you're describing as post-colonial studies proper, which is really kind of, Like a body that's more interested in like, uh, like the 
It, I mean, it does branch off literally into all of those dire directions, post-structuralist, economic, political. It, it does and it can do that. I think that the issue that we have is sort of trying to be aware of where it is involved in a kind of repetition of certain um, relationships and subjectivities um, as opposed to being really divergent. Uh, so that that's all that I would um, say to that. Yeah. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> thank you.